And that's it. We are live on the internet. It's like magic. <laughs> How you doing, Gordon? I'm doing fantastic, Eric. Yeah. So um, we were just talking that we had met at the NDPA conference in Fort Lauderdale, which I think was my first one. Had you been to prior NDPAs before that? No, that was my first one as well. Have you been back? I think it's, I was just going to say, I think it's my only one. <laughs> it was a really good one. It hasn't worked out yet. Yeah, it was a great conference. So if you went to one, that was a good choice. Mm -hmm. so, um, it may be my favorite one. It, it went really well. I like that one quite a bit. Um, well, there, there are a lot of pe a bunch of people who are interested in uh, preventing drowning. And uh, drowning is a tragic event uh, that is uh, so often uh, preventable. And uh, so folks who are trying to decrease the drownings in the world, that's, that's a good group of people to be with. But you're doing really really cool work. And I've heard, I think it's, it's through Mario Vitone. He's done a lot of stuff with you. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, um, the, uh, 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 it's on the web. It's called uh, Cold Water Boot Camp. Mm -hmm. Or there's two of them, or Beyond Cold Water Boot Camp, uh, where we took some people and actually ran them through, and we call it a real reality show. And he was one of our uh, real people. Uh, Bob, Bob Pratt just commented that he uh, he loves Cold Water Boot Camp. And, and not only just to see Mario miserable, but, you know, because of how good it is also. <laughs> yeah, that's right. well, we made people cold, that's for sure. Then, uh, again, the message there was how to how not to drown uh, or die of hypothermia in uh, if you're uh, if you end up in cold water. So, I mean, let's get right to that. You know, if someone falls in the cold water, what should they do? Well, the first thing is don't panic. Uh, so we have... Uh, we have what's called the uh, one ten one principle, and it's basically if you, if you end up in cold water, don't panic. And remember, you have one minute to get your breathing under control, 10 minutes of meaningful movement, and one hour before you become hypothermia due to frost, uh, due to hypothermia. And uh, yeah, so a lot of people, uh, most people think if you, if you end up in cold water, you're going to die of hypothermia within minutes. And uh, most people recognize that you can die from hypothermia. So that kind of leads the average person who doesn't know any better to panic because they think they're going to die right away. And uh, panic very seldom improves your decision-making process. And the reality is if, if you know that you're not going to, like the bo human body for an adult especially, we're a big chunk of meat and it takes a long time to cool it off. And uh, so we put, the, you know, we do experiments with people with a bathing suit on in eight degree water, which is like 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And it still takes us an hour to get them to be mildly hypothermic. So uh, if you recognize that you're not going to die right away, and you can go and that will help you not panic. Uh, and then you just recognize that uh, you have to follow. Basically, there are three phases in cold water immersion. The first one is the cold shock response which is just sort of lasts within seconds to a minute. And that's, uh, we've all experienced this when we have, uh, if you have a uh, sudden, you get in the shower, you turn the wrong uh, knob and you get cold water, you you, you gasp. And yeah, we saw we saw all kinds of people do that when they did the, uh, the ice bucket challenge, right? We exactly. saw a million people having that, you know, cold water shock response on the internet, you know? It's the cold shock response, which is yeah. hyperventilation, uh, a gasp followed by hyperventilation. And if you don't panic, that will that will uh, pass, you know, within 10 to 30 seconds. Uh, and then, you know, like it feels like life is over when you first hit cold water, especially if, if, it's, a, if, if it's a surprise. Uh, you know, but then once your breathing gets under control, you, you actually you, know, you feel you still feel terrible, but uh, not so much like you're going to die anymore. And then you recognize, OK, well, I can still do something. And so you make a plan. Uh, but as you are in the water longer, your muscles and nerves become colder, and uh, then they start not to work as well, and you start to have uh, uh, cold incapacitation. So you have cold shock response, cold incapacitation, and then hypothermia. So that 10 minutes of meaningful movement, it says, okay, I've, I've, got, I've got more than 10 seconds. I've got some minutes I can work with here. You know, where, where do I go? How can I get up? How can I get... You know, my boat over there, I could I could swim quickly over to it or, uh, you know, there's a life raft here. I can climb into it or I've fallen through the ice. I could get up on the ice as opposed to just sitting there, you know, panicking and thrashing around and then dying. So, you got one minute to get your breathing under control, 10 minutes of meaningful movement, 
in one hour before you become unconscious due to hypothermia. 110 one. 110 one. I like it. So besides teaching about that, what else was um, cold water boot camp? Well, so in that, uh, we uh, we first just threw a bunch through through our, our our TV guests into the water and see how they did. And, you know, they they you know didn't do very well. Uh, couldn't swim very far. They were hyperventilating. Uh, the other thing is, if you're going to swim somewhere, it's best to wait till the hypo hypovento sorry till the hyperventilation. A lot of very similar words. Yeah. And then start swimming because if you start swimming right away. While you're still breathing heavy, uh, then you start to breathe heavy because you're swimming. Then you start to panic a bit, and that is heavy you know, hyperventilation. And that stuff all feeds into itself. And, and before you know it, you can't control your breathing, and you're trying to swim. And uh, it's very interesting. We don't think about it much, but you can think about it as you go through your daily routine. Often, we entrain our movements to our breathing when we're walking, when we're jogging, especially when we're swimming. You know, like, well, if you're doing the crawl, of course, you have to breathe when your head's out of the water, so that's pretty simple to recognize. But even when you're doing a breaststroke or something, you're usually breathing with your stroke. So now if you get your breathing completely out of control, now to figure out how do, how do I do a meaningful swim stroke. And so it all just, and then your swimming isn't as good, you get more trouble, you hyperventilate more, you panic more. You swim worse, and then the next thing you know, you know, 30 seconds, you know, you, we've all heard stories of, you know, we, we, the guy fell out of the boat or whatever, and, uh, and you know, 30 seconds later, he was gone. Right. And that's part of the reason why. So you put your people in the water, in the water boot camp, and then... Yeah. Right. So then, you know, and then we went through, uh, you know, so, so there you go, you see how tough it is, and then we had a classroom session that was... A few hours long that's been distilled into separate sections and we talked about uh you know different we call them different chapters there's there's uh, you know what is hypothermia you know what's the cold shock response we talked about the the three phases of cold water immersion uh we also talked about uh self-rescue techniques uh how to treat somebody with hypothermia uh, and, and then we went out in uh, the next day and we did uh, some more exercises only this time you know they the idea was that they now have a bit more knowledge and uh you know their testimonials said that you know they did a lot better now that they knew what to expect even the tough guys like mario you know the coast guard rescue swimmer retired now but not then um uh, you know said you know boy it was uh you know because because coast guard swimmers they've usually got all the gear on right Right. And, and they're trying to rescue uh, people who don't have all the gear on, don't have the thermal protection on. Um, but when he, uh, you know, when he, uh, you know, all the rest of, of the folks we had on the show, it, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting wake-up call when you uh, end up in cold water uh, without any thermal protection on. And I've, if I recall right, you guys kept him in until he was hypothermic, right? No, no, we kept, uh, we kept all the... Uh, you know, we were out in a out, you know, not not in a controlled situation like in our lab. So hey, maybe that was a lab test he did with you. Oh, you, know, you might have done one, but it wasn't. I don't think it was in cold water boot camp. But anyway, uh, uh, for the for most of those, we just had people in like for 10, 15 minutes at the most. Uh, at times where, based on my experience, I know they're not getting hypothermic because we you know we didn't have any monitoring equipment out in the middle of right. Not the middle of the ocean, but we're out in the ocean. Or, yeah. or in the and I should say that the the bottom one of the bottom lines from all of that work is just recognize that uh, if you fall in cold water, you've got the one ten one principle and all of that. Uh, but you know, unless you can unless you can grab something that that floats, you're going to drown. So it all gets back to our number one principle. Anytime you get in a boat especially in cold water, you should have a PFD or a life jacket on because that changes everything. Because uh, you know, one of the tests we did, uh, uh, I think it was, maybe it was a, a pre-cold water boot camp uh, video we did uh, up in the state of Alaska. And we did sort of a test with one person with a life jacket and one without. Uh, and it was, uh, 
uh, in Homer, Alaska. And um, it was very interesting because this the, the guy, it was a guy and a gal. The guy had a life jacket on. And he jumped in, and he was flailing around like crazy. And we, the idea was we were we were going to try and stay, keep the two of them together. Uh, and uh, you know, the gal started swimming as we instructed, and, and he wasn't swimming at all. So we actually had to split up, and we you know we had two boats and two camera crews, and uh, and we left the camera with this the camera crew and a, a, a special forces rescue swimmer to uh, to take care of him. And uh, we thought, well, we'll have to go back. I don't know what his problem is, but we'll figure it out later. <laughs> and then we, we followed the gal who didn't have a life jacket on. So finally, she, she had cold water incapacitation. She couldn't swim anymore, as we expected. We took her out of the water. And as we were interviewing her, tell us about your experience. You know, uh, as I was talking to her, I could see over her shoulder, all of a sudden, this guy starts swimming by her. I go, well, where did he come from? So we finished with her. Then we went and caught up to him. And got him out of the boat, into the boat to talk to him. And, uh, you know, I said, like, what, so what happened? It looked like you were having a real tough time there. He says, yeah, as soon as I hit the cold water, I couldn't breathe anymore. Uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do anything. So I was thrashing around, trying to keep my head above water. And, uh, you know, within about a minute, I was completely exhausted and, and I couldn't do it anymore. And I, you know, I just, I just, I just collapsed, exhausted. And then I realized, Hey, I've got a life jacket on. So I just floated there for a while and got got it, got my act together. And then I could swim. He was swimming fantastic. But without a life jacket, he would have drowned within 30 seconds. For sure. Absolutely. You know. So what should people do if they fall in, into the ice? Because I know the uh, the protocol there is interesting. Well, it, the first thing, you still remember the 110 one principle. You've got one right. minute of the breathing under control. So first of all, so ice water, that's you know 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius. You know, the average person thinks, man, I'm going to die right away. And right. in this water, you feel like you're going to die right away. Yeah. And uh, if you remember the 110 one principle, you know, you know, I'm not going to be hypothermic even in ice water for a long time. Whether it's six, an hour or 50 minutes or whatever, it doesn't matter. You better have your problem solved long before that. And I will have some minutes where I can do something. I just have to get my breathing under control. Another thing we kind of say is, you know, if you, if you can survive the first minute, you're just going to survive the first minute, and then your chances go up exponentially. So, you know, basically grab onto the ice. Normally, when you break through the ice, uh, you know, you're close to the ice because you're walking or skiing. Uh, if you're snowmobiling and all of a sudden you hit open water and you might end up 100 yards from the ice edge, well, that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> and you're in big trouble. But, um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, get to the ice and just put your arms on the ice, get your breathing under control. And then, so this part, the one the one part, you know, people say, well, how do you get your breathing under control? It's pretty simple. Just take just take some deep breaths. Just force you, because you're going to be going, just stop, go. Take some slow, deep breaths, and that'll stop the whole chain of events. And then you'll be able to breathe normally. And then you can think clearly. And you can start planning, okay, now I've got to get out. So then the next thing is to figure out where do I want to get back up on the ice. And most of the time, uh, especially if you're walking or skiing, you were on ice that would hold you, and you've gone to ice that has become thinner. So this is part of the why you don't want to panic, because when you panic, you tend to you do whatever you're doing. A, your eyes open up, they stay open. You don't look around, you stay focused on whatever's in front of you. And if you actually start doing anything or going in any direction, you tend to go where you're oh, looking. So if you panic, you'll tend to go straight ahead, trying to get out ahead of you. And you have just gone into an area of thin ice. So the odds are the ice in front of you is still thin or even thinner. So once you've got your breathing under control, you can start to think clearly and you just go, oh, well. I just came from here. I'm going to turn around and try and get back up on there because that ice is presumably thicker because it was holding me. So uh, arms on the ice, and then it's just called uh, the kick and pull method. Uh, most people, or it's it's not uncommon that people will try to lift themselves straight up out of the water like you might do on a swimming pool deck, uh, which is fine because in a swimming pool deck, all you're wearing is a bathing suit, so right. and, and you're not freezing and all these other things. So 
that's possible. But in when you're in, in if you've broken through ice water, you've got some kind of clothing on or maybe a lot. It's now waterlogged. So when you try to lift yourself out of the water, the water in your clothing, once it gets above the water, you know, adds weight and it's very difficult. So we say put your arms on the ice and then uh, so you're kind of like this and then you say kick your feet. And what will happen is the back of your body will come up horizontal with the uh, ice edge. And then you just pull yourself along the ice. And so you're not really lifting anything very high. You just got to get it up along the ice. And then kind of swim out, right? Kick and pull, kick and pull. Pull with yeah. your arms, kick with your feet. Uh, if you're with somebody else, you can instruct them on this and yell and scream at them. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, sound level limit. Whatever it takes to make them do it, just keep yelling. Pick and pull, and then eventually you'll get up there. And then, uh, you know, you're still not out of the woods. You can you can crawl or roll away from the hole a little bit before you stand up. Be very careful, uh, and then probably follow your your uh, your trail back because uh, it was holding you at one time. That's perfect because yeah. it's not it's not intuitive, you know. Yeah, no, it's not. Yeah. The other thing is, and the importance of stopping and thinking, and. Uh, uh, it, it is not completely uh, unheard of that two people fall through the ice, two people on a snowmobile, it breaks through. Now you've got two people. Uh, the tendency will be each person works on their own. They're trying to get up on the ice. And uh, I've now been just in demonstrations. I've been in two situations where, where the ice kept breaking and uh, couldn't get up. And uh, the, the, the first time we were doing a television uh, a, a video production, and uh, we, we remembered, okay, well, listen, we, don't, we don't both have to get up at the same time, right? So right. We, we had two people working alone, and it was two people's weight on the ice at the same time, so that was double the weight. So we took turns. Well, you, you go first, and I'll go. And... Uh, you know, now there's half the weight on the ice. No problem. Got up. And it wasn't quite necessary in that case. But, but someone could grab you and needed some help. I could have pushed him up uh, or vice versa. And then he could have turned around and helped pull me up or gone to get something, whatever. Uh, so, I, again, it just takes the, it, it, you know, STOP is a very important acronym. S-T-O-P. In, in any kind of emergency or, or urgent situation, STOP think, observe, plan. And you can do a lot of observation even in 20 seconds. You just stop and say, you know, I'm getting I'm getting really tired, I can't get up, so how can I solve this problem? And uh, it's interesting, just well, this winter, I was uh, I was doing a, an ice rescue course, and then we were done, I had a, I had a thermal protection suit on, so there's no problem, and, and the ice was, like, there's no way we could have offered that course even four days later because the ice was very thin. It was fun because we were breaking through a lot and we could practice rescuing because that's part of what we were doing. But uh, I, the class was over. There were still people around. So I went out and I said, I'm going to go out here and just try this because I know it's pretty thin out there. And I walked out and I broke through and I could not get up on the ice. And what I ended up having to do is I, I had to, keep breaking the ice all the way to shore, which was like a, a hundred yards. I was exhausted when it was done. And, you know, and, and people were sitting while you say, okay, we should get a rope. And I said, well, no, I'm okay. Uh, you know, if I didn't have a, a thermal protection suit on, I would take you up on the arm. I'm just trying to see what I need to do here. And, uh, but it was interesting because there was another guy who had done the same thing. He was closer to shore. And I, uh, and even, uh, even I've been doing this for years, I didn't stop to think, okay, is there another alternative here? And the two of us could have come to each other. We, we, we could have, you know, we would have had to break the ice, but we would have got there. And then one of us could have helped the guy, you know, because we were very close, just get up and it would break. But if we could just have a little boost, we could have probably made it. Never, I didn't think about that until about a week later. But uh, so, you know, not that it was that complicated a problem, just need to stop and think, and it's very difficult. Even when you plan it, so so we just you know, the first two words: don't panic, 
think about what you're doing. Very, very important. And I like that stop acronym. I think uh, I could probably use that in life. Actually, it's uh, it's a good one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You have a car so, crash. You have, uh, you know, someone breaks their leg. Someone faints. You know, everybody thinks if someone faints, well, what do you do? You got to stand them up, right? Get them up. Get them up. Well, actually, maybe. Maybe not. They're on the floor for a reason. Unless they're lying on a, on a knife or something or a bunch of broken glass, it's not hurting them to lay there. Maybe I feel she just leaves them sit there and think about this a bit. What's the problem? It makes good sense. You know, so I'm sure, I mean, you talked about, you know, you yourself in the water. Um, I, If I recall correctly, you've used yourself as a test subject a lot of times in this cold water scenario. Is that right? Yeah. I've been, uh, it, it's 40 and holding. I've, I've, uh, I've now retired from getting really cold. <laughs> I, I, my life motto now is to practice the uh, Christmas spirit, and that it's much better to give than to receive. But I've, I've been hypothermic 40 times. Yeah. Why? Like That sounds, as a person who hates the cold, is from Florida, that sounds like the worst idea I could possibly think of. Well, it's interesting. I hate the cold, too. Okay. Uh, you know, people say, oh, you must love the cold. I say, well, no, I actually hate the cold. Just think, <laughs> about, think about oncologists. You know, an oncologist, just because he's an expert in cancer doesn't mean he wants it. Right. So, so uh, you know, I say, well, you know, what you have to do is, is uh, do it or, or think about what I'm telling you and do what I do and what I've learned. Because what I do when I get in cold water, unless I'm standing here for a demonstration, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of it as fast as possible. Because I, I'm not enjoying myself, but I when I started doing my master's thesis back in 19, I still I shouldn't give the date 86. <laughs> I, uh, uh, you know we need to make people hypothermic three times to to do a, a, a test, a study, and uh, so I, I I became a subject for three reasons. One is I needed a subject. Right. Two, I I wanted to be able to empathize with my other with my other subjects. And to be able to tell them, hey, I have done this. I'm not asking you to do something that I wouldn't do. And I know how it feels. And then the other thing is, I, you know, I, I experienced, you know, the whatever we were studying, which gave me uh, a little more insight into the actual results and, and a little more authority. I've had, I have had on the occasion, not much in the latter years, but early on, people might challenge me on a few things. And I would go, well, this... This isn't just a graph on a piece of paper. I'm one of those data points. I'm telling you, this is the way it works. So you know, if you want to argue some more, go ahead, and that usually shuts them up. So uh, yeah, so there's three reasons for it. Um, uh, yeah, and so either through different studies or, or demonstrations, uh, it, it's been 40 times. <laughs> Which that's that. Like I said, I, I hate the cold so much. The uh, even the prospect of that is making me upset right now. It's uh, I, I couldn't even think about it. If if it gets below fifty outside, I try not to leave the house. You know, yeah. Fifty Fahrenheit, you know, it's just uh, it's too much for me. I, I can't do it. But you know, so I mean, you, you talked about doing this as your master's thesis. You know, when you were a pretty young guy, you know, um, I mean, thirty something years ago, um, thirty two years ago. I, I imagine it means you were probably, you know, three or four years old when you graduated college. Um, you know, get, look, looking at your age and, you know, how long it was. But, you know, why, why, why? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, you look about forty, right? I mean, you do. Maybe it's the cold water; it kept you young, you know. <laughs> but, but why this? You know, why, why this topic? Oh well. <clears throat> I went, I, I took a year university right out of high school, hated it. I escaped to the mountains uh, for the summer and stayed for six years. And so while I was in uh, Alberta uh, and BC, I was a, a wilderness instructor, uh, mountaineering, whitewater canoeing, things like that. And so with clients, you know, around the campfire every night, you always have a talk about some topic that always included, you know, first aid, but always also included hypothermia and frostbite. So I had an interest in that, uh, in all of those topics, but uh, especially hypothermia and frostbite. And um, 
so we uh, then eventually I came back uh, to Winnipeg to fin because I always said I really should finish my degree uh, to finish whatever we start, uh, even if we don't use it later. At least if it, if you finish it, that'll be good for you. So I, I wrote a paper in one of my undergrad classes in a, in a prevention and care of athletic injury. Uh, I picked hypothermia. And so I, uh, in writing that paper, you know, I, I reviewed like 20 papers or so in the literature. And so then I, make, I, I now had the interest in the topic, but I also had a rudimentary uh, knowledge of the literature in the area. And then uh, I graduated and I'd done fairly well and was encouraged to go to grad school. So in my master's thesis, I was looking for a topic and I had this area that I was interested in and I had I knew about the literature in the area. So that's what made me pick that area. Nice. Uh, Bob Pratt wanted me to ask you. He says, uh, please ask Dr. Geisbrecht. I'm saying that right, correct? He's Brecht. Breck, I am sorry. I apologize. Uh, if he still advocates checking for breathing slash pulse for one minute, three minute of ventilations, uh, checking for another minute before beginning compressions. Sadly, the ILCOR, ILCOR standards treat all drowning as an afterthought, chapter 10 between avalanche and electrical shock, and they don't cover cold water drowning at all. Okay, well, that's interesting. So that's actually uh, combining several topics. Yeah. Um, so what do you do with, uh, you know, we've been talking about what do you do as a, as a potential victim. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're moving into what do you do as someone. First responder. The responder, whether you're a friend and untrained or a trained responder. Yeah, and that's a good question. So so the one, the, the, the checking for pulse for a minute relates to uh, non-drowning hypothermia. Someone is found in the snow somewhere. Uh, so, so basically, or they're found, you know, in a, with a life jacket on, their heads out of the water. So, if you haven't drowned, uh, we'll talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Well, okay. So, this is non-drowning, straight up cold stress hypothermia, laying in the snow. Uh, maybe pulled someone out from an avalanche, but that's a bit different as well. That's more like drowning because it's it's. Uh, now you've asphyxiated yourself. Yeah, you can't breathe. Yeah. But, but, you know, most hypothermia cases are basically cold air exposure some, of some type. Uh, so as you – so there are three, three uh, levels of hypothermia. There are actually four levels of cold stress. The Wilderness Medical Society uh, guidelines uh, stated this way, and I'm a co-author on that. Uh, you know, core temperature – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to give you uh, – Celsius here because I can't convert all of these numbers to Fahrenheit, but fair enough. Uh, Ninety-eight point six Fahrenheit is normal. Thirty-seven degrees Celsius is normal. Uh, the the uh, I actually can't convert a few of them. Uh, the clinical uh, threshold for hypothermia, mild hypothermia, is ninety-five Fahrenheit, thirty-five Celsius, and now I'm going to have to go Celsius. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, so mild hypothermia is from 35 down to 32 degrees Celsius. And when I give those temperatures, that's core temperature, which means the heart, lungs, and brain. And uh, moderate hypothermia is 32 down to 28. Uh, and during that period, as you're cooling there, you're going to eventually become unconscious. And then severe hypothermia is from 28 and lower. And that is that threshold, 28 degrees C, is the threshold for severe hypothermia because at any point from there on, uh, your heart is in danger at risk of stopping. And death from hypothermia is generally when your heart uh, caused by your heart stops. Okay. So now you find someone laying in the snow uh, and they're unconscious. So you don't know are they did they or they are they moderately hypothermic and their heart still beating. Um, uh, or are they really severely hypothermic and their heart has stopped? You have to figure this out because what we do with unconscious people laying on the street is, you know, we start thumping on their chest right away because uh, we think they've had a heart attack. So it's important, the, the one principle with, well, well, the general treatment for hypothermia, there's lots of levels, but the first two points is, are these, no matter what the situation is, gentle and horizontal. Treat your victim or your patient gently. Don't drag them around and treat them roughly. 
and keep them horizontal. Of course, if they're unconscious, that's not that's not a problem. But the horizontal part, because they're already there. But the gentle part is is very important because once you've become unconscious, your heart is really cold but still working. Uh, you actually can put them into ventricular fibrillation by rough handling. So if you'd left them alone, their heart would have kept working, you know. But if you dragged them around, you might put them into ventricular fibrillation. What is, uh, what is that? Ventricular fibrillation: the heart generally pumps like normally, and fibrillation is it just goes like this. So it's not, it's not. There's some action, but it's not pumping, pumping uh, blood. And if you don't pump blood long, long enough, then everything dies, and eventually your heart will just stop. Or the heart could just go into full arrest right away. It doesn't really matter. The point is, you put somebody into fibrillation or arrest out in the field, you've, you've almost killed them. You're still now going to try and revive them, but your, your odds are much less. So you don't want to start CPR, which is by definition rough handling. Uh, you know, we have people who, you know, report having broken ribs with people doing CPR on them, right? Uh, which is fine if you need to do CPR. So you need to figure that out. So long way to get around to this. When someone is unconscious, you need to know, you're trying to figure out if their heart's working, I don't want to do uh, CPR. If it is not working, so sorry, sorry, if the heart's working, I don't want to do CPR. If it's not working, I need to do CPR. How do you figure that out? You know, well, so you need to take a pulse. So you want to, first of all, do a carotid pulse. Don't bother trying on the wrist because that's a frozen limb. There there may be no blood flow there anyway. Or if it is, it's a very small blood flow going through frozen tubes. Trying to feel it there is not going to work. And the reality is the heart might only be working, might only be beating four or five times a minute. So if I go like this and I feel nothing and say, no, nope, nothing going, I better start. Well, I could have been doing that in between heartbeats because a heartbeat might be eight seconds apart. Okay. So that's why we say take one full minute to check for pulse and breathing, uh, and pulse and breathing, because if you can you can note that they're breathing, well, you don't need to feel a pulse anymore. If they're breathing, their heart's working, right? And so if you get either or of those signs, stop, do not do CPR, because if you do, you might kill your patient right there. Now, if after a full minute, and you should do it by the clock because we are all trained to start CPR right away. And to wait a minute seems like forever. So have somebody time a minute for you. And if you still might, they still might have a very weak pulse. Uh, but after a minute, if you haven't, if you haven't determined either a pulse or a ventilation, then you can assume the heart's not working and you can start CPR. And so the rest of the question was, um, I would give a breathing, pulse one minute, three minute ventilations, um, checking for another minute before beginning compressions. Yeah, I think I think we covered most of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you go a minute. Um, three minutes of compressions. There are two. Yeah, so you're going to start CPR. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you want to even stop and, and check again, right? Because, you know, we always do, we do. You aren't supposed to check because the idea of doing CPR is to restart the heart. So give it three minutes and then and then check again. There there are different versions of what happens after that. Well, there are there's a lot of people who, who don't think we should wait the minute. We can't wait a minute. Uh, uh, there are different versions of what happens after that. Minute. But the most important thing is to start that is to give them that minute to try and find see if they have a heart heart beat or not. So if you do, I mean, yeah, I guess if you you do, you know, get breathing or a pulse, there's yeah, there's no reason for CPR. Then you have a different problem. So you know. yeah, now you just have a hypothermic victim, uh, right. who's severely hypothermic, and now you have to really be gentle, keep them horizontal. Uh, now you want to get them insulated from the ground. You need to wrap them up in as much insulation as you can. Um, uh, often you'll be in a group that they, you've got backpacks. Uh, you might have, uh, you know, a sleeping pad. Somebody might have a sleeping bag. Uh, you should have a vapor barrier. So, so we tell folks that even even if if you're going if you're going camping, 
of course, you've got everything you need because you're planning to sleep in a tent and in a sleeping bag that night. But even if you go, uh, this is a very important point. Anytime you walk away from safety, I drive my car to a parking lot, I'm now going out on a trailhead, I'm going to do a hike, or I'm going to go skiing somewhere, I'm going to go backcountry skiing. Anytime while you're at the cabin and you're skiing off into the bush from your cabin, anytime that you go away from safety, you should ask yourself two questions. Do I, or a, a compound question, do I have the equipment and the expertise I need to be able to spend the night out where I'm going? And uh, so the, ex, you know, the equipment is, you know, do I, most important fire starter. Uh, the, uh, but of course, with fire starter comes the expertise. Can I light a fire? It doesn't, you can have a blowtorch, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you're useless and you can't you never lit a fire before you still might freeze to death um but uh you know and then you know whether i have a piece of plastic so you should always have some kind of day pack with you you know which which at the minimum should have a piece of you know eight by eight plastic in it uh that i could make an emergency shelter with or i could wrap somebody up in if if i you know if, if one of my colleagues gets uh, cold or if we stumble upon somebody um, so, you know, if you, if you seriously ask yourself the question, do I have the equipment and the expertise required to allow me to survive the night if something happens later on today, uh, and then act accordingly? No, I don't. Well, I'm going back to get the stuff. Uh, uh, and then, you know, that, that makes a big difference. And, and 95%, this is an actual, not, it's, not, it's a real statistic. Not like people just make them up. Ninety-five percent right. of search and rescues uh, are ended within twenty-four hours. They're, you know, uh, so so if you can survive one night, you know, chances are you're going to be found the next day. But if you can survive that first night healthy, then there's no reason why you can't survive a second night or a third night, right? Um, if you haven't frostbitten your hands, you know, if, you, if you're not stuck out there because you broke your leg or something, you're lost or, or, or you, you sprained your ankle, but you're, you know, you don't have some kind of life threatening injury. Uh, you know, if you can survive that first night uh, healthy, why can't you do it again? You might get hungry, you might start getting thirsty, uh, you'd be miserable, but you know, that's, that's it. But if you can't light a fire, for instance, uh, you know, then, then you, you you you're really you're really diminishing your, your probabilities, especially if you get into that second and third night. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, like boating, like a lot of these things, the the mistake comes in the planning stage, you know. Um, the lack of planning stage. The lack of planning, right? The you know, making sure I'm ready for what I'm doing more so than, you know, while I'm out there doing it. You know, I know Mario said that, you know, almost all of the you know, people that he encountered that he had to rescue, the ones who are in really dire situations, the vast majority of them, you know, did some kind of uh, failure to plan before they got in the boat. You know, it, it wasn't something they did on the boat. It was, you know, before they got in the boat. Failure to plan is a plan to fail. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's the old business adage, you know. So we, we kind of come in, in through the back door to this whole thing. But, you know, I have, a, a, I have an overarching principle that, that Mario would, would like. And uh, it's called three P's. And for whatever activity you're going to do, whether I'm going to go boating, mountaineering, skiing, scuba diving, whatever, three P's. Prepare, prevent, perform. So the preparation is planning and uh, learning skills. I'm going to go do stuff out in the woods. Uh, maybe I should learn how to light a fire. Uh, do I know how to ski properly? You know, the first time you put your skis on isn't when you put a backpack on to go on a five-day trip. Uh, just preparing for the normal skills you need, as well as what would I do if something happens? Uh, if I fall through the ice, I remember there's this one ten one principle I should think about. Uh, and then, of course, you know, so now I'm now I'm on my I'm doing whatever I'm doing, the event, and uh, so I want to you know prevention. Of course, we all know prevent. And now there's no there's no statement better than an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, because if you if you can stay out of the problem in the first place, 
you don't need a self, you don't need to survive. Nobody needs to search. Everything is fine. We go home and there is no story. But if something happens, either because you screwed up or something else happens unforeseen, uh, now you are in trouble, uh, then you need to perform. Because all the preparation in the world doesn't do any good if you didn't perform. You know, I can buy, um, you know, a nice fire starting kit. Uh, it doesn't do me any good if I put that in a storage uh, pouch on my snowmobile and my snowmobile broke through the ice. Instead of putting that in my pocket, it's in my snowmobile, and now I'm floating on the surface. And I get, I do the, I do, I remember the one ten one principle. Get my breathing under control. Now I do the kick and pull. I actually got myself up on the ice. I rolled away. Now I'm at shore, and now I'm going to freeze to death because I'm wet and I can't light a fire. Because even though I went and bought the right stuff, it's sitting at the bottom of the lake. So preparation gets to thinking not only, uh, you know, do I have the equipment, but as it were, it, it needs to be accessible. Well, it's, you know, it's funny. I uh, I just started a, a new business, and I think, uh, you know, the same applies to that. I could I could probably take the three Ps and apply them to just yep. about anything. You know. Yep. So I, we we really like using that a lot. I like it. So I know you've got to go shortly, but I, I would be remiss. You have a few more minutes. So yeah, um, I wanted to talk about because um, we haven't talked it at all about um, people sinking in cars, which has always been a, a paranoia of mine, actually, to be in a car and, uh, you know, it hits the water and, you know, what, what happens then? You know? We should just finish the cold water drowning. Yeah, please. So so, so we talked about, you know, the, the minute to minute uh, pulse and breathing check. Drowning's different story. Okay, I'm sorry, guy. Yeah, go ahead, please. Somebody who's drowned, you know, by the time you get there and pull them out, they've been there for a number of minutes. Mm -hmm. The thing about cold water drowning is you can survive being under the water. Well, I'll start to, you know, in a, in a backyard pool in July, somebody drowns. If they've been underwater three or four minutes, they are dead. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we, we know that if it's, if it's ice water or cold water, uh, they might be underwater 20, 30 minutes and might survive. Here is that much? I, I knew it was longer. I didn't realize it was that much longer. The, the, the record for the most longest document is 66 minutes, but obviously the longer it goes, the, the lower the odds. But let's 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 use 20 minutes as an example. Sure. No guarantee, but it's possible you should try to revive them. Here we're not talking about taking a minute to figure out if the heart's not working. Their heart's not working. So you just treat them. You, their problem is not so much cold. Cold actually protect the reason that they might survive longer is cold protects the brain from anoxia or hypoxia, no oxygen, which is what happens when you drown. Uh, so, you know, we uh, uh, like hypothermia, you'd like to warm the heart up. Cold water drowning, you need oxygen to the brain. That is the treatment. So it's straight up, you know, C CPR with or without uh, rescue breathing. You know, some there's some CPR protocols where you just do the pumping, and that's it. You get, you got the heart pumping blood somewhat, and the and the pumping actually brings air in and out of your mouth. Uh, so whether you do straight up only uh, compressions or compressions with breathing, that's all you need to focus on. Period. There is no. This is like you know the heart attack victim on the street. Start CPR immediately. Get into the hospital. So why does cold protect the brain? Well, it's a, yeah. well there's Do we a, know? complicated factors. Nasty things happen that the brain releases toxic substances when, when it becomes hypoxic. And if the brain is cold when it's hypoxic, hypoxic means low oxygen or no oxygen. Uh, if the brain is cold when that happens, it diminishes the release of these, these substances. And the other thing is, uh, as any tissue, as it cools, its need for oxygen decreases. So a colder brain uses oxygen slower so it can go a longer period without oxygen before it, it becomes irreparably damaged. My, my first thought is I wondered if there was any kind of evolutionary, you know, need for this, you know, to, for, for us to survive, you know, for our brains to be protected in cold. I'd, I'd have to probably think about it more, but... Uh, if, if it's that, uh, if it's a coincidence, or if it's something we've developed over over time, you know, not for the teleologic advantage, but bottom line, tissue, any tissue 
requires less oxygen the colder it gets. So uh, cars underwater. Well, I was asked to uh, testify uh, at an inquest uh, in 2006 uh, related to a gentleman who was was dry, worked for the uh, subcontractor for the government driving a snowplow on our winter road system. And the winter roads, of course, goes through frozen tundra, but also across lakes or water bodies. And uh, his, his, uh, his five-ton dump truck with a big plow on the front broke through the ice and sunk and he drowned. Uh, so they uh, they asked me to come and the, the inquest was in Winnipeg here. So they asked me, you know, we we have a cold water guy. We should we should get him to come and testify. And so you know, I testified about you know what my opinion was as to what all the issues were related to him. And as it turned out, a lot of what I said you know was incorrect. Uh, but one of the because of what I'm about to say, one of the things that I pointed out was there has not there's not a lot of research on this. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the end, uh, the judge said, you know, uh, you know, with, uh, amongst his, his uh, recommendations was that the government of Manitoba should fund some research in this area, and he knew who they should get to do it. So I got some money from the government to start, start studying uh, vehicle submersions in a more uh, research-related way, uh, proactive way. And so we, we first of all looked at vehicle sinking characteristics, and also, what should you do? And uh, vehicle sinking characteristics, important thing is, a vehicles like this, it'll start to tilt forward as water rushes in. Uh, it'll sink the, the, to the engine end, will go down. Most cars, except the VW Bug, have the, the, the uh, engine in the front, so it'll tilt forward. And as water comes up, the vehicle will go down, and you know it'll end up on the bottom full of water. If you haven't gotten out, you'll drown. Uh, so what we really figured out there was, uh, up until then, people have really thought about, you know, there's one phase. The, the vehicle's on the surface, and then the vehicle disappears. So it's floating, and it's underwater. Right. The main thing we, we came up with, which which is life-saving in my mind, is that it uh, there, are, there are three phases that, that – first part till it disappears is actually two very important and distinct phases. There's what normally lasts for a minute. So we've got the magic minute again. Uh, it is until it'll, it'll tilt forward and fill with water. But until the water gets up against the, uh, the windows, you can roll the windows down. So you're in a, you, you are in a boat with a big leak. And, you know, again, there's no need to panic. You have some time to think, and, and you just have to remember. Uh, again, I've got another another set of advice for you, and that is, you just have to don't panic and do not touch your cell phone, and remember uh, these words: uh, seat belts, windows, out, children first. So uh, you know, many people have heard. Uh, You've probably heard uh, Florida. You heard this probably for sure. It was taught in schools, some schools in Florida, that if you're in a vehicle in water, let the vehicle sink to the bottom, let it fill with water, and then you can open the water, open the door. So the problem is you've got water on the outside, and the level of, of water on the inside of the car is lower, so there's more pressure against the door. So you can't right. open. You can't open the door. door. Right. Open the door. Uh, so that is true. And the logic that if the when the vehicle is full of water, I can open the doors because the pressure is equal, that is also true. But the problem is the odds of you still being alive when the vehicle is completely full of water is very, very low. And I don't know many people who've ridden a car to the bottom, let the vehicle fill with water and open the door because by then they have drowned. But you are in a vehicle that is going to be on the surface for a minute or more. And until the water gets up, so we call the floating phase is uh, until the water gets up to and above the side windows, that's floating phase, or you could just open the window because there is no pressure against, like your window, if I go out to the parking lot, you've got a perfectly uh, functional window, but if I push against it and then I say, go ahead, open your window, your window won't open, right? Well, that's what happens when water and that's called the sinking phase. When the water gets up against the window, 
And now, even though you've got, you still have lots of air in the vehicle, it, and having done this several times, it's just a very, very scary time because you've got all you've got this air, but you can see that the air is getting less and less, <laughs> and you can't open that window because the water is against it. Uh, and so that's that that knowledge that you can open the window, but for a limited period of time, which is normally about a minute, is very important. So, uh, seatbelt off, window open, out, done, and that can be done. You know, we've had, uh, you know, we've had, uh, let's say, exercise where we say, okay, we're all going to get out the driver's side window. We've got people in the back seat. Uh, get in the water, boom! Now let's do it. And uh, I get out. Guy pushes the seat forward, gets out, you know, nine, ten seconds. So, you know, like you just think about it, like, okay, boom, okay, start the clock, I'm gonna take off my seatbelt, open the window, okay, it's open, I gotta get out. That's well under 10 seconds. And remember, you've got a minute to pull this off. So it's just a matter of not panicking and thinking about it. The reason we say don't touch your cell phone, you know, I was sitting right, actually, I was sitting right here. When I figured this out, I was thinking about all these cases and that I've been listening to, and people have made phone calls and then they drown. And, and thinking about I've got you know one minute before the water gets up against the windows and I can't get out. And I just say, you know, the, the bottom line here is if you touch your cell phone, if you touch your cell phone, you are probably going to die. Because what do you do with your cell phone? You phone nine one one. Well, now you're thirty seconds in. And now, what's what what the, it used to be? What is the 911 operator worried about? You know, where what where is your emergency? The nature and location. So now they start talking about because they're going to send help because they're sending help. And so now I'm going to talk about well, you're in a canal. Well, what canal? Where is that? And you don't know because you're panicked. And, you know, you've got the Carla Gutierrez case back in early 90s, right in Florida. It really started this whole thing because I've got a, a tape recording of her phone call to 911 and then you listen as she gets more and more panicked and then she drowns on the phone it's it's a brutal video uh, brutal audio um this is what really got us going on this uh so so it doesn't matter what rescue system there is you're not going to phone somebody that is going to dispatch somebody who's going to get to you and get in the water and get to your car within a minute Right, right. If they're right across the street, that's not going to happen. So uh, that's why we say don't touch your cell phone. You are here is a, an example of where you pack your own shoe. You are going to get out on. You're going to do a self rescue or you're going to drown. Uh, so seat belt off, window open, get out. And if there are children or somebody you know an el you know grandpa who needs help or whatever, you uh, you know get them out of their restraints. Try to push them out of the window first. Ahead of you, because if you if the water does start coming in, you'll be you'll be sure to push them out. So that's not going to be a problem. But if you go out first and the water starts coming in the window, the odds of you get it going back in the re it's 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 much much less. Once the uh, water starts coming in, I, I imagine it's hard to get out the window at that point, right? Well, uh, so hard first, but not impossible. First of all, you should be long gone by then. Right. There's no reason why you can. We have had. Two adults in the front, an adult in the back with a, a doll, not a child, but in, in a buckled in a car seat in the back. And he had problems undoing the, the, the car seat. And, uh, you know, we said, we're all going to get out the, the front driver's side window. Three adults undo the kid, get the kid out, you know, all in, I think I think it was 50 seconds. And uh, and there were some problems undoing. So the there's no reason why you should still be in the vehicle when the wind, when the water starts coming in the in the in the window, the open window. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, with a car, we've actually done this test. You name it, we've done the test. <laughs> Sat in the vehicle and let the water, you know, get up to what's really coming in, and tried to get out. And you know, if you're well motivated, you can do it. The reality is, it doesn't it doesn't matter because. Uh, so you can't push against the well, fine, take a breath. The car, in this case, because the window's open, the car will fill quickly and, uh, you know, the, the flow will, will diminish soon and then you just get out. Back to the truck, we did get a 
same a five ton truck with a snow plow on the front and we did do a test with that and uh once we let it go uh and this is why this this uh this victim had really no chance because it is so heavy it's sunk in three seconds so so i mean it was like we all we were all just standing there going what because we'd done all the car stuff and you know watch it float and sink and and uh it actually sunk so fast that the pressure on the outside built up so so much that it actually imploded the windshield and uh yeah so but not many of us are driving five ton snow snow plows on um, ice covered lakes but everybody in florida and many other places are driving long distances right beside bodies of water i mean florida is the mecca for uh, vehicle submerging drownings because uh, so many of your roads are beside canals and you have and then you have that situation because uh, as i understand it because uh, you know many highways are built on swampland so how do you build a road on swampland you take dirt out and, and build it up and the area and you just keep going so you've, you've dug a canal in order to make the road and you've got that canal by the road and uh, you've got you know so there you go so Remember, what, what are the what are the, the three main words seat belts windows out children first and how many times have you driven a car off in the water and rescue and gotten out yourself so i've been in the, in water in in a car in water and sunk you know i don't know 20 30 times uh driven four four it's much more exciting to drive, but it's it's more difficult because you got to find a place that will allow you to actually drive a car because <laughs> the car that's driving has some gas in it. Right. Um, you can you can take you can do some things to to prevent any gas from getting out, but a lot of areas just won't buy that, so they won't let you do it. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, yeah, it's it's very interesting. It's fun, you know. It's fun driving a car in the water if, if everything else is taken care of. You know, you know what you're going to do. You've got rescue people around. But uh, the bottom line is, in, in all cases, there's lots of time to open the window. Uh, I should mention uh, back to the Carla Gutierrez story and many since then. I think it was 1991, and there was a call at the time from from her fiance, I believe, and other people saying, you know, we need to change these. It might have been 2001. I may be going back to probably 2001. Um, the year doesn't matter. There was a call to say, well, we should do something with the 911 protocols because just asking somebody over and over again, where are they, isn't going to help because uh, because it, the person's drowning. They need to do something. So right. we need to give them advice. So, and I thought, yeah, we need to give them advice like uh, seatbelts, windows out. Um, and uh, I fortuitously was asked to uh, help rewrite the uh, 911 protocols for, uh, for one company that provides uh, emergency dispatch protocols for about 60% of the English speaking world. Uh, and uh, hopefully Florida subscribes to that system or well, you have many different jurisdictions, but the, the, the folks who have get their, uh, get their, uh, their protocols from that we have written, if you phone them, if you didn't listen to my first advice, don't panic, do not touch your cell phone. Not everyone will have heard that or remember it. We are absolutely locked in uh, using cell phones for everything. In fact, some people will probably take some pictures of the water, post it first and then phone <laughs> uh, Do not do that. Um, uh, but... Uh, if you if you phone uh, dispatchers where they have our protocol, they will now say, you know, what's the nature of your emergency? And as soon as you say my vehicle's in water, they will immediately, they might get a general idea to send somebody, and then they will move into, can you take your seatbelt off? All right, can you get to the back seat? And we talk about if, if you have time to give advice, we say get to the back seat because that back window will be out of the water longer than the front window. Nice. And, uh, and uh, when I say back in front, I'm still talking about the side windows. Can you open the window? You can't open it. Okay. Can you break it? And then they'll give, you know, uh, uh, 
instructions as to how to break it and then say, are there, is there anybody else in the car? All right, get them out of their seatbelts, get them out of the window, push them out first. Okay, now you get out of that vehicle. Instead of having them sit and trying to remember and tell exactly where their vehicle is, what color is their vehicle? Well, it's it's red, but it's the only one floating out in the water. I mean, it's, <laughs> so, yeah. So we, th- and we actually know that this advice has... Uh, we just had a case in January, I think, uh, in Florida, in Collier County, I believe, uh, where, you know, when we were at the NDPA conference in Fort Lauderdale, the next day we drove across Alligator Alley, 100 and however miles with canals on both sides, and stopped to visit a site where somebody had just drowned a few days ago um, in a car in a canal. Uh, and we gave a... a a, a, a one-day seminar on vehicle submersions. And um, we know that there they do have our protocol because in January, a woman was driving with a child in a car seat in the back and accidentally ended up in a lake, called 911. They told her what to do. She got out. Phone went dead. The, uh, the dispatcher thought that she'd actually lost the, uh, the victim. <laughs> And then someone a couple of stations down said, oh, no. I got her on the phone again because she slammed the shore and then phone 911 again said, no, I'm out. I'm good. So we know that we know that it's saving lives. I mean, it's good info. And, you know, it makes sense if you think about it ahead of time, right? It's hard to figure out in the moment what you should do. Well, especially a car of water. Yeah. Because now, now for sure. Your eyes are wide open like this. You are looking oh, yeah. ahead, and uh, you know you have probably heard, unless you've listened to this podcast, you know <laughs> you've heard or Facebook cast, you've heard some version of this, let the vehicle fill with water. You know we we've had a we've even had a case where so, a witness case where someone drove in and their window was open. And their vehicle was floating, and the woman did her window up because she she you know we can't ask her because she drowned. But uh, I can imagine it was some mixing of messages. One is she wasn't going to get out of the vehicle because you got to let the vehicle fill with water. Right. But an- another natural instinct said, "Well, I don't I you know water is going to gush in here, so I'm going to shut the window." Uh, you know, and then by the time you know. By the time, if she ever did think about trying to open the window again, it was too late and she drowned. Seatbelts, windows, out. Shoulder first. Got your three Ps. You got your seatbelts, windows out. You got your 110 one principle. You're good to go. You got your kick and pull. Kick and pull is only two points, but that's okay. The less points. <laughs> well, thank you, Ben. Really, I, I really appreciate this. I think this info is, is life-saving. Um, I, I did want to ask you where, who gave you the name Professor Popsicle? Outside Magazine. Outside Magazine? They wrote a, uh, it was interesting. They wrote an article about me in 2003. And, uh, and uh, so I was introduced to that like everyone else in the population. I was in the, uh, I knew when it was coming out. The, the, uh, and uh, I was, I happened to be uh, traveling somewhere. So it was the Minneapolis airport. I was in between flights, and there was a bookstore, and I could see there's outside magazine. So I went and opened it up, and it said, "Meet Professor Popsicle." Well, that's the first I'd heard that they were going to that they were going to try that, uh, use that moniker, and uh, it stuck, and uh, that's good because uh, uh, most people I know actually know me as Professor Popsicle. They can't remember <laughs> my name, but and I don't really care if they remember my name. All I care is that they remember the life saving messages that we try to get. Get out there. Our our lab motto is uh, "Vita Salvantis," which is uh, Latin for saving lives. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, I guess that's better than Mister Freeze or. Uh, well, I get that too. I get all kinds of versions of yeah. you know, Professor Popsville, Doctor Ice, Doctor Freeze, whatever. Any of those work. They're fun, and uh, they they uh, certainly portray what I do, and uh, and people. Yeah, people people remember what Professor Popsicle said, but they can't remember what Gordon Giesbrecht said, which is fine. I don't care as long as they remember. It. I would go with the um, the boxer. I would, I would triple G. That's, that's, that would be my name of choice. But yeah. 
Well, my middle name is Grant, so I am Triple G. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, you're Triple G, like uh, like the very. But it doesn't mean much. Right. Exactly. You know. Well, hey, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time, and you know, this is great info. Well, thanks for having me, uh, and uh, you know, my uh, I'll end with my advice that I give to everyone who leaves one of our experiments, which is keep cool, but don't yeah. freeze. Perfect. And is there anywhere people can find you? You know, is there yeah, anything you plug? Uh, well, you can find our stuff on coldwaterbootcamp.com or beyondwaterbootcamp.com. Okay. We also have another educational program, which is the land-based version of Cold Water Bootcamp, which is um, <laughs> oh man, now I've lost it. It's uh, oh baby, it's cold outside. Nice. Uh, and it's the let. It's just the the first letter. So Bico, B I C O. Okay. Survive dot C A, and uh, and then I'm at the University of Manitoba. Uh, you can find me there as well. Perfect. Well, thank you, Gordon. Have yourself a great day. Thanks for listening, and uh, you know, um, stay it's cool. Prevent, perform. Stay cool, but don't freeze. Yep. And Good. don't panic. See ya. All right. Bye, Gordon.